The sound you hear is the sound of my washing machine. It is a Wednesday evening. I'm wearing a sheer, nude, philosophy di Lorenzo Serafini slip that I purchased from a thrift store for $20. I had a glass of Prosecco that day to celebrate. Tonight, I'm pouring myself a glass of red wine from a bottle I acquired from a trade with my parents. I gave them an archival print of my artwork in exchange for this bottle of Spanish wine. I'm reading a prose poem by Baudelaire called The Double Room. I'm reading it because a recent commenter on one of my videos shared it with me. Thank you, immensely, by the way. And I happen to have a copy of 20 prose poems that I borrowed from the library, which contains this one. The candle I've lit smells of tobacco, a favorite scent of mine from high school. An old friend used to buy candles that smelled of tobacco before they became popular. I think she was a French libertine in a past life. The glass from which I'm drinking is French as well, from a brand called Luminarch. They are famous for their black-stemmed glasses. I'm sitting on my couch, in my nude slip, drinking my red wine, doing my laundry. Everything you see and hear in this video is real and not staged for your delight. This really was how I spent my Wednesday night. My life looks like this because I choose to prioritize beauty and because I'm disciplined about it. Beauty doesn't necessarily need to insinuate power, wealth, or prestige. Beauty can be extracted from the mundane, although I believe the mundane, the normal, the regular don't have to be viewed as such. There really can be beauty in doing your laundry. Life is what you make it, and art is what you can get away with. All paradoxes exist. Utilitarian can be decorative. The monotonous can be ritualistic. Ugly can even be beautiful. There is raw material everywhere for you to work with. It simply takes noticing more and feeling more and giving yourself the time to notice and feel. It takes a keen sensibility to make art out of nothing. But even more than that, it takes discipline. Slow living, soft living. Those are only novel names for movements that have affected us before. It was once called minimalism or bohemianism, transcendentalism, asceticism. Although these movements are different, when you get into the meat of them, when you really dig your way to the bone, they are the same. They all brandish the same hallmarks. Simplicity, humility, frugality, potency of experience. Once human beings lift the veil and understand what life can be like outside of the rat race, outside of debt, consumerism, trends, conventionalism, pride, prestige, pageantry, there is no going back. There is no reversal. Sensualism, if you're new here, is a lifestyle philosophy I'm working on and is no different than slow living, soft living, minimalism, whatever you want to call it. Let me say it loud and clear. Life is for living. These existential movements are all just trying to get us to understand that. Life is for living. How do you make the most out of just another day? First of all, stop looking at it like it's just another day. For me, as a sensualist, it's being selective about the kind of wine I drink or what glass I drink it from. It's cherishing the clothes on my back for their craftsmanship. It's fawning over the great achievements of our race, the creation of art and philosophy. It's noticing the smell of the air or the blue jay in the tree. It's allowing the concept of time to fade so I may appreciate any and all the details that I can perceive and interpret. And all of this here I can do in solitude in my own living room. Like Thoreau, I have my own moon and stars here. I need nothing more to be happy. Slow living, sensualism, their virtue isn't excess like it is for many movements that pervade our culture. It's about making yourself rich by making your wants few, being appreciative of what you have and remembering why you wanted something in the first place. 
And while I may like Italian leather shoes, and while I may not bathe in the Walden Pond at dawn, I know me and Thoreau pursue the same bliss. Again, life is for living, no matter the method. It is about being alive, not filling a void with a bunch of stuff. Slow living is about, you guessed it, living your life slowly. That is, adjusting your perception of time and causally adjusting the value of what you come in contact with. Many people think that when you have less contact with something or someone, you value it higher due to its ephemerality. But the contrary is true. If you have less things for longer periods of time, their higher value becomes known to you. And as a sensualist, I believe in a few fine things. Time seems to be a common denominator for many counterculture movements, including my very own sensualist movement. We all loathe time. Time is the cattle prod to the gallows, and in Baudelaire's own words from the double room, yes, time rules now. He has resumed his brutal dictatorship. He pushes me as though I were an ox, with his two-pronged goad. Move on there, beast. Sweat, you slave. Live, convict, live. Many of us are this ox, moving through our lives almost as if against our will, feeling like we have no time to really enjoy the moments that pass. So what does everyone suggest? those mythic ambassadors of the great movements of slow living, the martyrs of bohemia, the outdoorsmen of transcendentalism, the ambiguous deities of minimalism. How can a person escape the bondage of time? How can a person simplify their life so as to make it more enjoyable, more fruitful, more beautiful? The senses, whispers the sensualist. Developing a fine gauge of perception. Notice everything. And when you can't notice anymore, refresh, diversify. Do something you have never done before. If you won't do it, if you can't step out of your comfort zone, then ritualize. Convert into ceremony the things you will not stray from. Do not take the mundane, the normal, the regular for their veneers. Look within them. Look microscopically. Find the infinite within the finite. Time. How do we conquer this great dictator? How do you feel more? Slow down. Slow down your brain. Bring that raging locomotive to a screeching halt. Breathe. Stop the incessant propelling forward. Hit the brakes. Breathe. And that's when the overlooked things come into focus. They bloom. They come out from their hiding places to greet you. I could have thrown my laundry in earlier today, and in that amount of time it takes for my laundry to be done, I could have fit quite a few things in during that duration. But I love the sound of the washer and dryer. So instead of doing five things at once, I decided the time it takes for my clothing to be washed and dried gives me quite a bit of time to just read and drink wine. To close out, I will read The Double Room, a prose poem by Charles Baudelaire. A room that is like a reverie, a room truly soulful, where the stagnant atmosphere is lightly tinted with rose color and blue. There the soul bathes in idleness, made fragrant by regret and desire. It is a thing of twilight, bluish and roseate, a dream of delicious pleasures during an eclipse. The furniture is formed of elongated, prostrated, languishing shapes. The furniture appears to be dreaming. It seems endowed with a somnambulistic life, like vegetables or minerals. The cloth materials speak a silent language, like flowers, like skies, like setting suns. No artistic abomination on the walls. In relation to the pure dream, 
to the impression left unanalyzed, definite art. Positive art is a blasphemy. Here all things possess the required clarity and the delicious vagueness of harmony. An infinitesimal odor, almost exquisitely chosen, which is mingled with a very slight dampness, floats in the atmosphere where the soul in a trance is lulled by hothouse sensations. Muslin flows abundantly from the windows and from the bed. It pours out in snowy cascades. On the bed lies the idol, the sovereign of dreams. But how does she come to be here? What magic power has established her on this throne of reverie and voluptuous delights? What does it matter? She is here and I recognize her. These indeed are the eyes whose flame pierces the twilight. These are the subtle and terrible eyes which I recognize by their dreadful malice. They attract, they subjugate, they devour the gaze of the impudent man who contemplates them. I have often studied them, those black stars that call for both curiosity and admiration. To what benevolent demon do I owe the joy of being thus surrounded with mystery, with silence, with peace, and with perfumes? O oh, beatitude, that which we generally call life, even when it is fullest and happiest, has nothing in common with the supreme life with which I am now acquainted, and which I am tasting minute by minute, second by second. No, there are no more minutes. There are no more seconds. Time has disappeared. It is eternity that reigns now, an eternity of delights. But on the door, a terrible, heavy knock has resounded. And as in some infernal dream, it seemed to me that my stomach received a blow struck by a pickaxe. And then a specter entered. It is a bailiff who has come to torture me in the name of the law, an infamous concubine who has come to proclaim misery and to add the trivialities of her life to the sorrows of mine, or else the errand boy of the editor of some newspaper who is asking for the sequel to the manuscript. The paradisiac room, the idol, the sovereign of dreams, the sylphide, as the great Rene called her, all this magic has vanished with the brutal blow struck by the specter. Oh, horror, I remember, I remember. Yes, this hovel, that dwelling place of eternal boredom, is after all my own. Here is the stupid furniture, dirty with chipped corners, the fireplace without flame and without embers, sullied by spittle, the dreary windows on which the rain has traced furrows in the dust. The manuscripts, effaced or incomplete, the almanac in which my pencil has marked sinister dates, and that perfume of another world with which I inebriated myself by means of a perfected sensibility, alas, is replaced by a fetid odor of tobacco mixed with some indescribably nauseating mustiness. Now the room is filled with the rancid air of desolation. And this world, so narrow and yet so full of disgust, only one familiar object invites me. The vial of laudanum, an old, terrible mistress, and like all mistresses, liberal of caresses and betrayals. Oh yes, time has returned. Now time reigns absolute, and with the hideous old man, the whole of his demonic retinue has returned. Memories, regrets, spasms, fears, afflictions, nightmares, rages, and neuroses. I assure you that now the seconds are strongly and solemnly accentuated, and each one spouting out of the clock says, I am life insupportable, implacable life. There is only one second in the life of men 
whose mission it is to announce good news, the good news which fills every man with an inexplicable fear. Yes, time rules now. He has resumed his brutal dictatorship. He pushes me as though I were an ox with his two-pronged goad. Move on there, beast. Sweat, you slave. Live, convict, live.